So hi, once again, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, DevOps community event, Crosstech. Uh, for those who is joining us for the first time, I will just introduce the event, which is Crosstech. <clears throat> it's an exclusive online DevOps event. Uh, this event was initially planned uh, as an uh, event with two speakers, but unfortunately, due to some personal reasons, uh, we're having only one speaker, who is James, today on the call. Uh, so, but it's not a big deal because Ademola will join us on our next uh, Crosstech events in the future for sure. So stay tuned. I will make sure that he will get a chance to speak and share his incredible talk about him transitioning from uh, QA engineer to DevOps engineer, which is super exciting and exciting not only for the DevOps community, but for the wider community. But we have James today, uh, who is amazing. Uh, and his talk is about Kubernetes preview deployments with S2 and GitOps. So I won't take too much of his time and I will just let him introduce by himself and proceed as he wants that. So James, the stage is yours. Yeah, hello, mic check. Can you hear me? Yeah, crystal clear. Ah, fantastic. Um, just realizing also it's been a while since I used to Zoom, so I am unable to share my screen. Just give me a moment. I need to adjust my permissions, then I'll share my screen. Sure, take your time. Okay, sure. Thank you. I believe James is disconnected, but that should be a temporary issue. Until that, until we're waiting for the James, I was just say thank you for 66 people who decided to join us today in live. Uh, I believe a lot more people will watch it as a recording, but it's awesome to see that we have quite some people who are interested to see it in live and participate in our live events. So thank you for that, folks. I'm really happy to see every single of you. Hello, Frank. Nice to see you on our call. Until, <coughs> sorry, until we're waiting for James. <coughs> Frank, since you, oh, yep, so aboard that idea of filling the empty spot. Uh, James, you're back. I guess you should be good now. Yep. Awesome. So the stage is yours. We good now? Can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, welcome to Crosstalk. And uh, yeah, just a little technical challenges. Um, because sometimes they happen, rough landing, but we'll be flying in a moment. Um, so honored today to be talking about Kubernetes uh, preview environments with Istio and GitOps to. All of you guys, uh, my name is Lema Yan James. You can call me Lema or Lem or Le or even L, any variation of my name I accept. <laughs> um, and uh, in today's talk, uh, we will be talking about uh, exactly this. So what are preview environments? Why do we need previews? And uh, how do we get there? So this is going to be quite a fast talk. So if you have questions, you can feel free to, uh, is there a raise hand function? Not sure, but uh, I'll pause from time to time to take questions. And uh, uh, without further ado, let's get started, guys. So we'll start with uh, what are preview environments. So I'm pretty sure 
most of us here are uh, at least devops ish devops ish in the sense that uh, you've worked in a devops environment you're interested in devops you're in, an enthusiast uh, or you are an expert like most folks here so this is not a very difficult question to answer what are previous environments because we know that we are talking yeah. in the context of deployment environments and uh, for us who have worked in startups or scale ups it's mostly this easy what where you have a local environment you add features or developers add features they could there build stuff and uh, there is this aspect of promotion where we move to code changes to staging or a dev environment just an intermediate environment uh, where features are tested acceptance load and performance testing uh, before we finally get to real business and uh, we get to uh, customer success and basically profits and losses um, or maybe you've worked in enterprise environments which is just this more of the same maybe more intermediate environments it could be a standard uh, DTAP environment where we have development testing acceptance sometimes even pre-production but it doesn't really matter you get it it's just uh, deployment environments okay so in that same vein uh, when we talk about preview environments we are talking about temporary on-demand environments that we can create whenever pull requests are made and uh, destroy whenever pull requests are closed uh, this is quite interesting uh, because i'm pretty sure very few of us actively do this and uh, one of the things that we really want to do as um, effective or efficient devops engineers is reduce time to market while driving down costs and uh, reducing waste and all that stuff and uh, one of the ways of reducing stuff is by not having it so ephemerality is really important in that aspect uh, but yeah i think i'm already going into the why uh, why do we really need preview environments because you might be wondering right now it works well in my organization we have five environments and uh, we, we use uh, a git flow or uh, whatever git workflow you're using to promote uh, your artifacts across various environments and uh, you're probably just wondering maybe this new maybe this not new but if it's new you're wondering what problem are we solving by having preview environments and uh, like many other things in the devops space kubernetes is the answer but what was the question <laughs> uh, so yeah most of the problems we solve on a day-to-day -day basis are around uh, microservices and quote unquote the cloud that can mean whatever you want it to mean uh, but microservices uh the paradigm they are it's a very awesome thing to have happened at least in the last 10 uh the last decade 10 years uh, this is when we've seen a lot of uh people moving from this simple stuff where we just have one application does you know most of the things you want it to do um handle state and handles all the business domains um to this where we now have many smaller applications um and uh, we can leverage things like domain driven design and have uh, even different teams pizza size teams small or big doesn't really matter Your organization could be so different but this is the paradigm we are breaking things mostly breaking away from monoliths and creating microservices and uh, those the early adopters of uh, microservices uh end up with something like this this is netflix uh it doesn't look so neat but uh it's quite functional a bunch of services all those nodes talking to each other accomplishing a common goal um something as easy or as complex as you watching your favorite series looks like this okay and uh you might be saying oh well i think 
if this is the destination, it causes you some jitters. Maybe you are the only DevOps or you're in a team of DevOps engineers who, you know, there is a DevOps style that is uh, uh, quite inclusive and shared learning, the CALMS principles. And I've also worked in some organizations where DevOps is like a cross-cutting function. So in, uh, in that case, you are almost essentially a gatekeeper. This can cause you chills, uh, but worry less. Um, this is actually more advantageous or rather the pros are to outweigh the cons. Uh, we're not going to talk about microservices, but I'll just uh, gloss over some key benefits uh, that will influence the direction of uh, what we are about to talk, ab talk about is uh, from this splitting up of microservices, of uh, monoliths to microservices, we have been able to see improved scalability. We can increase uh, the capacity of one specific service without having to worry about much more complex topics like federation, replication, replicating a whole monolith can be very expensive. And uh, this has allowed us to also be a little bit tech agnostic. So if we are building a performance oriented service, we are free to uh, explore technologies that we think are more performant than others. Uh, although the performance debate is quite hot, uh, depending on where you work. And uh, we also see better fault isolation because um, with the microservices architecture, we are able to basically uh, pinpoint one single service. And if well architected, uh, once the failure of one service should not uh, cascade to becoming a failure of the entire system. And uh, from business perspective, we are, we are actualizing a lot of business agility. Uh, because now we are free to experiment, uh, we are free to uh, basically scale linearly. Uh, that means that we can hire more people, put them in new teams, build uh, new microservices from scratch. Uh, the only thing that we care about is like the uh, interfaces and uh, how those communicate and integrate with each other. So these are like the very key benefits of microservices. We have, of course, the list can be long. Um, but uh, with these benefits, like uh, any other thing, challenges also come. And I will not go into detail about challenges, but I will just focus on one uh, challenge that we aim to solve. And that is the challenge of increased operational complexity. Uh, with microservices, we have seen um, a lot of advancements in how we basically manage them all the way from virtualization to containerization. And we are now running hundreds of containers and we got to a lot of different methods of orchestration. That's the birth of Kubernetes and all the other orchestration tools. So that, that solves increased operational complexity in some way because we are seeing it in four dimensions. It's how do we manage all these microservices? That's orchestration. How are we able to troubleshoot them? Uh, and that speaks a lot into monitoring and observability. And uh, of course, infrastructure complexity comes in with where you're deploying all these things. So you could be using Kubernetes, uh, but also because of how microservices work, you end up having a lot of other third party or in-house tools to help with one of the four uh, operational complexity topics. And uh, finally with microservices, they have to talk to each other. So inter-service communication is one big thing. Yeah, so we've had so many ways of solving these things um, in the past. So many tools have cropped up. Um, the DevOps space has like the highest number of uh, open source tools at the moment almost the highest number of open source tools. tools, tools being applications that are just built and open source to help solve with a certain problem. Uh, but in a more generic aspect, how we have tackled these problems and how we continue to tackle or rather to solve operational complexity is through automation and abstraction. And uh, 
Automation is quite obvious. We build pipelines, we write automation scripts, uh, we use infrastructure as code for repeatable um, infrastructure provisioning and configuration. Uh, but abstraction is quite interesting. Abstraction is um, where we now, you know, accept that there's, there is still space for specialist skill. And uh, you do not expect everybody in your entire engineering organization to be a superstar in cloud orchestration, IAC, uh, debugging pipelines. So those who have that technical expertise create easy abstractions for other people to basically be able to do their own stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, it is on this same vein that um, uh, today's talk is based on uh, creating ephemeral preview environments. And uh, we try as much as possible to just uh, explore how we can create this easily without um, exposing a lot of the elements, okay? So, and what are the benefits of uh, this? So if guys are able to automatically deploy their changes to a live environment, we will see a lot of increased developer productivity. And why is this? Why do we need to deploy to a live environment? Uh, you see with microservices, uh, depending on the size of your organization, you could be having a handful of services um, where you have, let's say less than 20, less than 20 is manageable. Um, and maybe you use a tool like Docker Compose to run a section of them locally for local development. If uh, one service, other service depend on a specific one, let's say like identity, for example. Uh, but over time, you will realize that it gets more and more cumbersome to run more services locally. So we end up having a dedicated environment that is a dev or stage environment. Um, and on this dev and stage environment, everybody wants to merge up their changes so that they can do integration tests. Um, and yeah, you could be having a very robust QA team with automated integration tests and uh, all that, but it's still inevitable that at one point in all this, you need a dedicated uh, dev stage environment, uh, whether people deploy directly to it or uh, people use uh, tools that communicate with the dev environment. I think like telepresence is a very interesting tool. I haven't used it yet, but it does something quite interesting in allowing you to basically or communicate with the live environment from a local service and appear like do telepresence, appear as if you are deployed in that environment. Uh, but yeah, as that is a problem that is uh, still being solved, uh, we still see a lot of um, dev, dev stage environment contention. Um, and uh, if you've worked in a fast moving company with multiple teams um, and multiple microservices, upwards of 20, uh, you will quickly realize that uh, people have various ways of mitigating dev contention. Uh, one of them is, for example, creating a staging calendar where if we know we have some changes in a certain microservice that uh, is, for example, changing the contracts, we know for sure that we don't like changing microservice contracts, but sometimes we, we have to change them. So we change them while trying to maintain some form of backward compatibility. And uh, such changes uh, end up on what is called a staging calendar. Or um, in my current company, it's, it's like a dojo where people have to jump on a meeting, deploy that specific microservice, then test whether, test the other uh, dependent or upstream, downstream microservices, whether the whole uh, system is working perfectly, run a bunch of integration tests. And uh, the faster you move, the often this happens. Uh, you start having contention where many changes need that dojo or that um, uh, staging calendar test, okay? Um, and uh, this slows down things because also if uh, we are uh, running uh, some tests on staging, uh, it's quite often the case that 
deployments to that service are paused, uh, at least to that specific environment. So uh, a lot of developers now have to wait and we need now preview environments where each test can be, or each feature change can be independently tested on an environment. And that's why we're saying one of the benefits is increased developer productivity because now uh, we don't have uh, to wait. We don't have to set up um, staging calendars for that specific function. And um, with this also, of course, the compound effect is we have a reduced cost to market, cost in terms of time um, and also cost in terms of quality because we can test more rapidly, we can test more confidently and also cost in terms of developer time. Engineering time is also expensive. Yeah, so that has been a mouthful. And uh, how do we really get to a place where we have uh, these preview environments? Just the how. And uh, yeah, I must admit there are so many ways of killing a cat. In fact, we have uh, companies or full-fledged startups that are basing their business model on just solving this. So you can check out a few. I think we have ephemeral.io. Uh, there is Release Hub. There is there, there's a number of startups that just will help your company solve this problem. But uh, maybe if you are you have enough engineering muscle, or you just like building things in house, or um, yeah, you have time, engineering time, or you just find uh, innovating interesting then you can build this internally. Two ways you can go about it. Of course, one is uh, being able to stand up and uh, shut down complete environments. So for example, if you're deploying to a Kubernetes cluster on AWS and you're using uh, EKS, you can, you can use uh, cloud formation templates um, or your Terraform scripts to stand up uh, multiple clusters for multiple users and uh, just use your Terraform scripts to take them down as well. Yeah, but uh, since this talk is focused on Kubernetes, uh, we, we do not even explore the route of uh, creating complete end-to-end -end environments. One, because it is expensive. If we wanted to create end-to-end -end environments for each and every pull request, it means um, you might end up with quite a number of dev-sized environments, which is quite expensive. So uh, assuming your microservices are running on Kubernetes, then uh, the solution that we're talking about today is how we can use Istio and GitOps uh, to achieve uh, ephemeral environments. So to have a workflow uh, that deploys our microservices into an environment by every pull request. Okay. And um, just to have everyone on the same page, Istio is a service mesh or uh, say a service mesh implementation. And uh, a service mesh, there is a much more robust <laughs> uh, definition on the documentation that goes into the details about what a service mesh does. But keep it sweet and simple. My definition is a service mesh is just the communication between software components made into its own thing. So you remember one of the problems or rather one of the challenges uh, with microservices is uh, inter-service inter communication. And uh, a service mesh is here to help with at least handling that kind of communication. So the workings of a service mesh are not that complex. Um, it's just the simplest, okay, not the simplest, but the most common implementation. We have a lot of other implementation, but this is just what a service mesh in a nutshell looks like. This is straight from the Istio documentation page. And uh, what you're looking at here is uh, basically two services, service A and service B. Uh, Take the bigger box around it, around service A and service B um, to be a Kubernetes pod. 
So remember that a Kubernetes pod is the smallest uh, scalable unit on Kubernetes. So service A is a container and uh, we have this other special container that is a proxy. So normally service A and service B should be able to communicate directly. So that blue line that is going from proxy to proxy in a normal situation, it should be a blue line straight from service A into service B. So if uh, service A was calling service B, let's say service A's orders and service B's products, that, that communication uh, normally is directly, whether it's on HTTP, gRPC or whatever protocol. But now what, what uh, a service mesh does is it introduces this concept of a proxy where a proxy is injected into every pod as a sidecar container. So a sidecar container is basically a container that runs uh, as a side to the main container. And now this, this proxy, of course, does what a proxy does. It intercepts all outbound uh, network connections from a pod. And uh, that means that now when service A is calling service B, the proxy inside service A will uh, intercept that call because remember that containers inside the same pod uh, share the same network namespace. So the proxy is able to see that call and basically intercept it. Um, and the same happens because service A, of course, knows the IP address of or um, the service discoverable name of service B. And uh, in that case, um, okay, it's actually not the service name, but uh, you get what I mean. So it knows the discoverable name of uh, the pods in under service B through endpoint slices. And uh, once it sends traffic to that pod, the first thing that receives all the traffic is the proxy. Yeah, so all these other parts are like uh, the components that make up Istio. So the control plane, the mixer, uh, the citadel, and uh, the pilot. We probably won't go so deep into those. We won't even go into those. We're just looking at how uh, Istio as a service mesh works. And uh, this is basically what it does. Uh, it deploys uh, proxies, which are Envoy proxies, uh, as sidecar containers into service pods. Okay, and uh, those are able to intercept network connections between uh, services, and uh, not only um, within specific pods, but within an entire namespace. You just need to annotate that namespace, that Kubernetes namespace, and say uh, you need um, Envoy proxies to be injected into that namespace, and uh, this is what it's going to do. So effectively, um, Envoy sidecars will sit on all your Kubernetes edge networks. So all the edges, uh, all, the, all the pods, if all the pods have a sidecar proxy, uh, that, that uh, connection of proxies are communicating to a single control plane and uh, they will send information on things like telemetry, um, telemetry in the sense, telemetry, tracing, metrics, um, uh, all those things. And that is now what makes up a service mesh. So you can see um, uh, these guys there. Uh, for example, if you were calling a product page that, ha that calls uh, an API endpoint that is a detailed service, um, yeah, it will, it will go through three proxies. One would be, of course, the ingress, uh, which will have um, a proxy in itself, then the product page will also have a proxy and the details will also have a proxy. So this allows us to do traffic shaping because uh, we have we can see all the addresses uh, within the uh, Istio control plane. And uh, this also makes our networks a little bit intelligent. Intelligent in the sense that we can now program things like timeouts into our networks. So for example, if uh, the product page was calling uh, the details page and the details page was taking too slow to uh, to respond. We don't want to keep um, 
the customer waiting there. So we take a fail fast strategy and we set like uh, X seconds timeout on that. So we just we just return an error message that timed out. Or uh, let's say the details um, service was a little bit intermittent, intermittent in the sense that maybe there was a scale down event or some other adversely uh, service affecting event that made the service a little bit unstable. So it was throwing errors uh, or maybe there is one unhealthy node, but that of course will be caught by liveliness and readiness probes. Uh, but let's just say the details service was intermittent. Then in that case, we can program some retries from the proxy level, basically retry requests to the detail service at a certain cadence or after some time. Okay. So in that case, the product page is not going to be aware that uh, its requests are being retried, but the proxy is the one that is retrying the requests. And also uh, it's important to know that the Envoy proxy is a transparent proxy. So your services uh, do not know in any way that they're communicating to a proxy. They even don't know the address to that proxy. Yeah. So it still does all this um, traffic shaping using a specific resource that is known as a virtual service. So for example, we just saw this, this example was from uh, uh, a course resource that I took. So we just saw a details page that is being called by a detail service that is being called by a products page. And now we have two versions where we want to basically traffic traffic shape or split traffic between them. And uh, this is done through Istio's virtual service. And uh, what a virtual service is, it's basically like an abstraction over and above what we know is the Kubernetes service. So a Kubernetes service is uh, a resource that uses, uh, that basically, um, to explain this. So all, all Kubernetes uh, deployments are registered to, no. uh, it's okay. A Kubernetes service is what enables service discovery on Kubernetes. And it does that uh, at a very high level using uh, selector labels, okay. Uh, for this example here, we can see that we have a selector label that is uh, basically going to match all the pods that have uh, a selector up equals to reviews, okay? So the, ch uh, the challenge here is that we want to rather do some kind of traffic shaping, okay? Like we just saw here, we want to forward some traffic to details v1 and forward some traffic to uh, details v2. And uh, yeah, for that, for that we we do use a virtual service and it's nothing it's not rocket science so a virtual service is coupled up with what we call destination rules to just do almost the same thing a kubernetes service does but now we can subset labels so each pod is now having two labels one is of course the app name which is reviews and uh, one is the version and uh, the native kubernetes service is going to route traffic to all those pods um, now the virtual service is going to route all the traffic to the native Kubernetes service, but uh, it's going to use destination rules to apply that uh, traffic or rather it's going to use destination rules to apply a subset of that traffic to uh, a subset of the pods. Um, so from a configuration perspective, I think you can you can lift this straight from the Istio documentation, but uh, this is what it looks like. It's just uh, adhering to the normal, of course, uh, Kubernetes API spec. Um, you, we use a virtual service definition and um, a destination rule definition file, both are YAML files. So here, this, this is almost the equivalent of the Kubernetes service. And uh, and uh, it sits on the edge, so it's like a mashup of a Kubernetes service and a Kubernetes ingress resource. So if you know what an ingress does, an ingress allows you to 
uh, basically expose uh, your cluster IP service to the to the outside world and apply some routing rules uh, to traffic that is directed to the exposed services. So virtual service does almost the same thing, actually, uh, from an ECP perspective. Um, and uh, that's why you can see here that we specify some gateways. Uh, that is another Istio resource that is now an equivalent of a load balancer type. Um, and uh, we specify some hosts. Then we also now specify traffic rules. So for HTTP, we can use query parameters. We can use cookie headers. Uh, but basically, we can use a number of parameters, including URIs to specify the route or the destination of the service. So in this example, uh, we are routing uh, we are routing our traffic to the example app service. Um, and uh, for this specific example, I created two rules uh, just to simulate the case where this lower rule uh, would be the default rule where all the traffic goes to the example app subset. And then uh, we have another, the first rule that has query parameters is just one way of trying to do traffic shaping uh, where we route uh, some of this traffic to another destination that is called example app PR2. So this would be like the second pull request on that example app repo. Same host um, and same uh, port number then the destination rule is where all the magic happens. So uh, we just set this subset here and the subset uh, says that uh, example up here two should be all the pods that have a pull request ID two. So that is just using a custom label. That's why I have namespaced it under example up.com. Yeah, so I think there is just a slight learning curve there, but uh, we can, we can proceed. Yeah, so that is uh, in the Kubernetes cluster level. Okay, so just configuration stuff. And um, why we're using Istio is because it's it's far much more easier to do traffic management with a service mesh than you would uh, with like, let's say just an ingress or other native methods. Of course it's possible, but uh, it's it's much more easier and you also get more benefits from using a service mesh. Yeah, so on the process side of things, where well, we were going to use GitOps, and uh, it's just a way of implementing CD, uh, where now we we kind of changed. The main difference between just traditional CICD and GitOps is a paradigm shift um, in terms of how the tools work think so in GitOps, Git is the center of everything. So we have to have all our configuration stored in Git. So with storing all our configuration on Git and using infrastructure as code, we are creating a rather developer-centric experience when um, operating infrastructure in that way. So a traditional pipeline would usually look like this, where you just commit some stuff to Git, then it's going to be built. Uh, in the build process, we could run some tests, unit tests, integration tests, and um, then end up with a container image that we will push to a container registry. And uh, here from the container registry, we now have a continuous deployment or continuous delivery process that will often involve us pushing the artifact to the cluster. So pushing that container image into a Kubernetes cluster, um, mostly using kubectl apply or some other variations like, you know, Helm, Customize, JSONet, whatever. But now a GitOps approach is uh, a little bit different. So instead of uh, us uh, just using kubectl apply or Helm apply, uh, the CD process is now based on Git. So once we have pushed the container image to the registry, 
we'll notice that the first few steps are almost the same. We push the source code, create a container image, uh, push it to the registry. Uh, but once we've pushed it to the registry, um, we need to have a separate repository that just has uh, application configuration. So uh, with GitOps, you have at least uh, one infrastructure repository, infrastructure in quotes, because it can be, you could have multiple, you could have a Terraform a provisioning repository and then just have like a chats or um, a Kubernetes repository just full of Kubernetes manifests with customize and all that. But at least you need to have one infrastructure repository and then uh, multiple app repositories. So the first four stages, that is uh, committing the code, the building and pushing happen in the application repository. Those could be multiple, uh, push an image to a container registry. And then because we are now managing everything on Git, uh, we can automatically open a pull request on the manifests and configuration repository and update, let's say, the container image tag, okay? And uh, now GitOps tooling and a very common example is Argo CD is going to basically pull uh, that Git infrastructure, Git repository. And once we have any updates done to it, we are going to use the GitOps tooling to pull. Now, instead of us pushing into the cluster, uh, the GitHub tool is deployed into the cluster and it's going to pull uh, the new configuration and apply it into the cluster. Of course, this comes with a handful of benefits, uh, including at least uh, slightly improved security, because um, if you are pushing to the cluster, then I believe uh, you had to create uh, credentials for that to access the cluster from outside. Uh, but now with... Um, a GitHub tooling like Argo CD, for example, you don't need to provide any cluster credentials because uh, the GitHub tool is going to be deployed inside the cluster. Yeah, so this is like uh, the biggest uh, difference between normal CCD and CCD using GitOps. Uh, so the biggest uh, or the heaviest thing to lift here is having that. Uh, centralized configuration management repository where all your configuration sit. That that means everything, including things that change often, like the application version changes often, and that change should be uh, stored on Git. So at any one point in time, Git should be the source of truth. Yeah, so you can achieve this through uh, Argo CD and uh, or rather the Argo set of tools. So we have uh, Argo CD, Argo workflows, Argo image updater, and all that stuff. Or you can just get the GitOps tool itself, like just have Argo, Argo CD only, and then uh, continue leveraging your own CI/CD tools. So if you are using things like uh, Jenkins or um, Bitbucket pipelines, GitHub Actions, Circle CI, Travis, all that stuff, you can keep Keep on using that for the CI part until you build the container image. Then you use uh, a GitOps tool like Argo CD to continuously uh, pull and sync the cluster state with uh, what is defined on the Git repository. Yeah, so what we uh, expect to have at least a simplified expectation for what a prevent environment workflow should look like is uh, once we commit code and push to a feature branch, uh, of course, the next obvious thing we need to do is open a pull request uh, where we can now run all our predefined quality gates. So if you have like approval steps or minimum approvals, run unit tests, integration tests, and uh, all such quality gates, those run on an open pull request. But uh, then, the thing that we are adding here is the ability to test on a live integrated environment. Okay, so um, I think that's, I have really taken a lot of time. So I'll quickly just uh, sum it up there. 
and uh, we can we can open the floor for some questions. Uh, this is uh, an interesting topic. I think it would be more effective if we did it as a code lab. There is a chance we might do that in future code lab with maybe a blog post shared with uh, code samples on how to do stuff. But yeah, I hope uh, we picked a thing or two from this and we can jump straight to questions. So I'll just jump to the last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. It was an amazing talk. Uh, you did great. Thank you for your time. And now we're heading to the questions. Yes, uh, I can see already we have Christian. Uh, you can just type your question in the chat and I will just ask the question. Or you can raise your hand uh, and unmute, and you can ask the question on a call. <clears throat> Whatever works for you guys. Yes, Christian, please. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Um, yeah, really, really great presentation, very informative. Um, I just have one question. So given that we have like multiple environments, like maybe dev, staging and the likes, um, what's the best practice for um, the domain names that we use for these environments? Because I think we might want to avoid users from stumbling into this environment because these environments might not be as safe and protected by production. So what's, what's the best practice for hosting and access to these environments via the URLs? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so the best practice for domain names is consistency. Um, you pick one way of doing it. Like uh, some people use subdomains, uh, other people use hyphens, but uh, whichever route you pick, you, the best way of doing it is being consistent at it. And then uh, I will separate the issue of environments being protected and handle it as a separate uh, issue. Uh, with that, I think uh, if you want your dev environments not to be publicly accessible, it's something you can do. Uh, depending on the cloud provider you are on, you can use identity aware proxies. Uh, I think GCP has one, AWS has one too, or you can default to using VPNs. Um, because for sure, if you are thinking that having some cryptic subdomain name that is hard to guess uh, is going to make your dev environment secure, I think uh, that that could be a little bit misleading because we have crawlers and all those things that will discover whatever you have published online. And security by obscurity is often not the best idea. I hope that helps. Well, I hope that answers your question, Christian. Uh, yeah, thank you for the thumbs up. Uh, so the next, next question is, what is the best practice for managing secrets with agro CV for public repos? From Philip. Awesome. Yeah, that is a very good question. Managing secrets, by the way, is uh, one of uh, the most challenging topics. Um, and uh, once you add public repos to the twist, uh, it even gets more challenging because uh, you really need to know who has access to what. So there is the GitOps way of doing it, where we say all the secrets live on the repository, but they are encrypted with various methods of encryption. Uh, the most common one is using GPG keys, where you can add uh, people to um, a certain GPG group uh, using tools like Gitcrypt. Um, that's that's a, a good one. Or um, you can have secrets on the repository and instead of encrypting them with uh, GPG, you can use tools like Kibsil where you use the actual 
uh, Kubernetes cluster, private key or SOAPs. Yeah, there is a bunch of tools for when you want to uh, encrypt secrets to uh, and have them live on the GitHub repository, even if it's public. And uh, there is the even much more uh, older or what I would call enterprise way of doing it is by using a secrets management solution. So an open source one is a, a vault, HashCorp vault, uh, but all the cloud providers have secret management solutions like GCP KMS uh, or, and uh, also AWS has similar, Azure has similar. And uh, because you are on Kubernetes, uh, you can use uh, things like external secrets or uh, Helm secrets. Helm secrets actually is a pretty neat plugin that does secret substitution. Uh, not sure if customize has a similar tool, but uh, just to make this short and sweet, you have two ways. You can use secret management solutions like Vault or the various cloud provider secrets management solutions, or you can also use a set of open source tools to encrypt your secrets and have them live on the GitHub repository. But the best practice, I think, neither. Depends with uh, the culture of your team and uh, also the organization posture. Because what is not best practice is having your secrets in plain text anywhere. <laughs> I agree to that. And yeah, that would so sounded to me like a good answer to your question. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Philip. Uh, any more questions? We have, okay, we have. What is the difference between Minikube, Cube, uh, ADM, Kind, and Cops? Yeah, I think to me, there is no difference. <laughs> uh, the only difference is uh, okay, all of these are uh, mini Kubernetes cluster management or creation tools. Uh, the only difference is the level of abstraction you get from each. Minikube is the most popular. That is when you want to run a Kubernetes cluster in your own developer machine. Minikube has the best documentation. Uh, it's almost the easiest to go with. I think kind is a little bit easier because it was developed later to solve some of the problems that Minikube introduced. And uh, kubeadmin is uh, the recommended way of creating uh, Kubernetes clusters on premise or on your local machine. If you want to go like bare knuckles and just create your own cluster without using uh, things like Minikube kind, you just use kubeadmin and it does the same magic for you, you end up at almost the same place with a localized Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so no difference. The only difference is the level of, of abstraction. And uh, if you intend to use this for local development, the kind of developer support that is around it. I think Minikube is the um, most mature for local development because it has a lot of documentation and has been around for a while, but yeah. Kind is also making some noise. So in case you are, you are wondering what's the difference so that you make a choice, you can start with Minikube then um, try and explore the rest later because Minikube is the one with the most documentation. Cool. Awesome. We have a couple of more, more minutes. So I think we can take the last question if we have one. I guess we don't have the last question. So in that case, I have like, uh, yeah, we have a couple of messages. Uh, thank you, James. Yeah, I, I agree to that. That was an amazing presentation. And thank you for your tangent. That was truly awesome. Uh, and to finish this off, I have a quick poll for you guys. Uh, this is just a two question poll that was introduced for, uh, by Community Champion. Uh, and I would love to share it with you. So feel free to answer these questions and we will use this information. It's really interesting to see the results for us. Uh, and I will share this later in the chat as the results. So here's the poll. Feel free to answer it.
Amazing. We have quite some results already. Okay, 30 more seconds. Uh, so more people can finish this off and we'll call it an event. We'll finish this off. So we have some more time to complete the poll if you want to. 36 responses so far, which is good. Thank you. Thank you very much so much for to every single person who already did that. If you want to do that, please do. All right. I'm about to close the poll in 10 seconds and that's going to be it. Two. One, that's it. Awesome, thank you. I will share results uh, with video recording uh, after it's gonna be processed, it's gonna be tomorrow in the beginning of my day. So I will share video uh, and I uh, hope to see you guys on, on our next uh, cross tech calls, which are happening soon. We already announced one with Frank Addo. Uh, and we will try to include Ademola, who unfortunately had to miss today's call. Uh, so maybe you will just hear his talk in the next one. So have an amazing day. Thank you, James, once again. And I hope to see you soon. See you soon. Have a lovely day. Bye, folks. Okay. Bye, guys. Thanks. Yeah, cheers.